So, moving swiftly on, the next item of business is the presiding officer said his portfolio of questions on infrastructure investment and cities. Question one, Rob Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what carbon saving would be made by removing one supermarket lorry from the A9 between Edinburgh and Thurso and carrying the contents by rail. Minister Derek Mackay. Based on the DEFRA DEC carbon emission figures published in 2014 and the latest data published by the Rail Delivery Group, the Scottish Government estimates that for each tonne transferred by rail freight rather than by road, CO2 emissions would be reduced by up to 75%. The actual carbon savings may be dependent on loading figures. Gibson. I thank the Minister very much for that answer. Uh, you should perhaps understand that 90% of the supermarkets in the Highlands are within a mile of the railway and that many supermarkets deliver provisions by van to the most far-flung doors in the country. Will the Minister explore the possibility of a new means to deliver supermarket stock which can be unloaded from containers and picked up from rail sidings en route to supermarkets so that further redu reductions can be made in greenhouse gases? Minister. Uh, yes, I will consider that, as we are currently refreshing our rail freight strategy and we will consult on this uh, over the summer uh, of this year. And this will include steps that the rail industry can take to encourage and support innovation and growth in the rail freight sector. Thank you very much. Uh, question two, Wardle Fraser. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made uh, on reducing journey times on the Highland Main Line between Inverness and Edinburgh. Two additional train services were added to the Highland Main Line in December 2011, increasing the number of trains from 9 to 11 per day between Inverness and the Central Belt. In December 2012, following technical improvements between Perth and Inverness, journey times have been improved by up to 18 minutes in some services. And further journey time improvements averaging around 10 minutes, the introduction of an hourly service between Perth and Inverness, extended to either Glasgow or Edinburgh, and increased opportunities for freight will be delivered by 2019. Fraser. Can I thank the Minister for his response? But I'm sure he will know. In 2007, the uh, SNP and their manifesto promised to cut journey times from Inverness to Edinburgh by 45 minutes. The latest figures available show that the average journey time between Inverness and Edinburgh has reduced, but by nine minutes, and the Monday to Friday service between Inverness and Edinburgh is actually taking longer than it did in 2007. So when exactly are the Scottish Government going to deliver on this eight-year-old promise? Do we have to wait a generation? Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is currently working on the next stages of investment strategy for future control periods, so we will uh, continue to work on our manifesto commitments. We are making progress. We are modernising uh, the railways and we're investing a significant sum of money. But I tell you, it will be aided by the proposals that the SNP has put before the people in this Westminster election that will mean more spun, uh, spending on infrastructure than would be the case if the Tories were re-elected in reducing infrastructure spending. So it will come quicker with the SNP than it ever would have done with the Tories. Okay, Dave Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Clearly, I welcome any uh, increase in the, the speed of journeys, particularly for freight between Inverness uh, and the Central Belt. Would the Minister share my view that one of the practical technical constraints is that the vast majority of the line is single track, and secondly, that serious increasing in signal lanes required to increase the speed on that particular service? Minister? Yes, Mr Stewart is absolutely right. There are technical and infrastructure requirements that will require to be addressed to help achieve the reduction in journey times that we would all wish to see. So the, 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 the point is a fair one. Um, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, can, I, uh, can I draw members' uh, attention to my register of interest in relation to my role in Rail Future UK and my presidency as Scottish Association for Public Transport. Can the Minister confirm that uh, in Scotland we are investing more than double the per capita investment uh, in our rail network than is the case in England and Wales? Minister. The Scottish Government is committed to investing £5 billion in Scotland's railways over the next five years to 2019, including over £3 billion capital investment in network rail infrastructure. And yes, on a per capita basis, this is more than double the equivalent investment planned by UK ministers. Many thanks. Um, 
John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the, the Minister what steps he can take to ensure that developments in the Central Belt do not mean that there will not be slots for any improved uh, frequency of trains on the Highland Main Line? Minister. Well, of course, it's always a balancing act, but we are investing in the infrastructure in Scotland's railways to improve journey times across the country, expand capacity and improve the customer experience and reach out to, to parts of the country. So, of course, in considering capacity, demand and timetabling issues, uh, we would ensure uh, that the Highlands and indeed every part of Scotland is fully connected to the central belt. That's our aspiration. Many thanks. Uh, question three in the name of Neil Mirby has not been launched. An explanation has been provided. Uh, question four, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what changes it has planned for government procurement. Government Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, a public consultation on changes to the planned procurement rules in Scotland ended last week. Uh, we are currently analysing the responses to that consultation. We will consider these as we take forward our plans to transpose the new European procurement directives and to implement the provisions of the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014. Gavin Brown. Grateful for that answer. The Federation of Small Businesses Scotland has suggested one change to procurement, uh, namely as a minimum publishing spend with suppliers broken down by business size, including micro and small businesses. What is the Minister's initial response uh, to that proposal? Cabinet Secretary. I think I said in my substantive response that we have just finished the consultation exercise and I would rather wait till we have seen all those responses to the consultation exercise before making a definitive view. But some of the points, which are the, point, the substantive point he has raised uh, in relation, I think, to the idea to try and make sure we give as much advantage to, as possible to small and medium enterprise businesses is a point that is well made. We very much have that uh, in mind. And at the same time, we want to make sure that um, there is not an overburden of bureaucracy as well on uh, public bodies and others when they're involved in procurement. But we do try to reconcile, we will try to reconcile uh, those interests. But as I say, we'd make a substantive response when we've managed to consider the consultation responses. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain how the Government will ensure coherence between the uh, Procurement Act statutory guidance, which has just been consulted on, and the three-part duty on public bodies set out in the Climate Change Act. At stage two of the Procurement Reform Act, when it was a bill, Nicola Sturgeon offered to have further meetings, further discussions with myself and Patrick Harvey about the development of the, um, of the guidance on the rejection of my amendment on climate change. And I quote, to encapsulate the points made... The question is... Uh, very, very briefly, will the Cabinet Secretary now agree to meet me and, and Patrick Harvey to discuss this further? Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Well, I should say I would hope that Claudia Beamish and Patrick Harvey have responded to the consultation, but of course I'm more than happy to meet uh, with Claudia Beamish and Patrick Harvey on that issue. Many thanks. Neil Finlay. Um, when the public procurement bill was passed, uh, the Minister, uh, the responsible at the time, said that all that was needed was guidance to come in to deal with the issue of blacklisting. Can the um, Minister, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, tell me uh, of any project in Scotland where the Government's current approach has prevented a blacklisting company from gaining a public contract? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I can say is that we have put into the provisions of procurement that no company involved in blacklisting will be allowed to have a government contract. I think it is worth pointing as well, I think, I think Neil Finlay actually knows this, employment law is a preserve, unfortunately still, of the UK government. His party refused to agree to allow employment law to be devolved to Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is the UK government responsible for that. We have taken action, the firmest action I believe in the UK to prevent blacklisting in future and will continue to do that. If at some point he wants to work with the government on trying to achieve this, I am more than happy to do that. But not by trying to make points like that, because I think we have taken very effective action to prevent blacklisting up till now. Thank you. Question five in the name of Margaret McCulloch has been withdrawn and an explanation has been provided. Question six, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to increase investment in roads as a direct result of forecasted population increases. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Strategic Transport Projects Review, the STPR, is a 20-year plan for investment and it took into account forecast economic and population growth up to 2022. 
Despite uh, Westminster's real terms cuts of about a quarter to Scottish capital budgets between 2010-11 and 2015-16, this Government continues to take decisive action to accelerate economic recovery through our investment decisions. We have invested more than £6.5 billion in roads since 2007, with a further £698 million to be invested this financial year to ensure that our strategic road network remains safe, efficient and effective. And looking forward, we will continue to implement the SDPR and our infrastructure investment plan, including completion of the largest transport infrastructure project in Scotland for a generation, the Queen's Ferry Crossing, and of course the duelling of the road network between Scotland cities. Cameron Buchanan. I thank the Minister for his response, but does the Scottish Government consider that it would be better to assess planning applications after it is known how infrastructure will develop in the area? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we, we do, uh, I would say to the member we do do that, but we also have to take into account when a planning application made, is made what the likely impact on the infrastructure will be. Of course, it's a, a correlation which is underlined by, for example, policies such as no uh, detriment. So when a, a planning application provides additional burden on the road network, that should be taken into account during the planning process. So there is a link between, uh, obviously, planning uh, and the infrastructure requirements. We've also provided assistance in relation to other infrastructure developments, uh, or rather housing developments, to help with the infrastructure costs in the past and the link is really between the investment, in, uh, investment, investment plan for infrastructure uh, as well as the planning process. I think these things are taken into account. If he has some ideas as to how that could be done uh, more effectively then I'm more than willing to listen to those but I can assure him that's done at this present time. Thanks. Graham Day. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can, can the, Minister, uh, the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Scottish Government, despite those Westminster Tory cuts to Scotland's capital budget of over 25 per cent over the last five years, is actually committed to embarking upon the largest road investment programme that Scotland's ever seen? Cabinet Secretary. I think that's true, and I think it's worth remembering why it's true, because uh, the Secretary of State for Transport at UK level said recently, a few months ago, that Scott, the problem in Scotland was the lack of investment in our transport infrastructure. Now, this was a previous transport minister from 1989, I should mention. But he's mentioned that because it's correct. We have not had for decades the investment that we require, both in our road and our rail network. The point that was made earlier on to uh, Derek Mackay forgets, of course, the fact that we've had beaching. We've had massive disinvestment in our rail and road infrastructure. So we we are doing what we can to make sure that we turn that around. Again, as Stuart Stevenson pointed out, twice the level of investment per head uh, in Scotland in the rail network and also in relation to our road network. It seems to me a modern developed economy should at the very least have motorways or dual carriageways between its city and it's this government that will achieve that. Many thanks. Question 7, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the transport recommendations made by the Committee on Climate Change in its 2015 progress report. Mr. Derek McCann. The UK, government, uh, the UK Committee on Climate Change 2015 progress report showed that Scotland is outperforming the UK as a whole in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. However, we have the ambition to do more and we're already taking action on some of the transport recommendations made in this report. For example, our Switched On Fleets initiative helps overcome barriers to the adoption of electric vehicles by providing expert analysis to highlight where electric vehicles can be most effectively introduced into fleets. And we're backing this analysis with £2.5 million of funding to enable councils and their partners to act by buying or leasing electric cars or vans. Thank you. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The Minister says that they're taking action on some of the recommendations, but it's unclear whether all of these recommendations have been accepted uh, by the Scottish Government. Perhaps if they were, we might hear fewer speeches about how great it is to have the, most, uh, the biggest road-building programme that we've ever had, uh, as we heard in the last question. On the final recommendation, uh, the Government is called on to assess the carbon impact on any proposed changes to the air passenger duty. Does the Minister agree with me that it would be bizarre to assess the carbon impact, find that the carbon emissions were going to go up as a result of proposed changes, and then proceed anyway? Minister? Well, we have to take a, a, an overall a look at carbon emissions, and it will fit within our overall policies. If we look at everything we've set out in terms of the transition to the low-carbon economy, I would point out just in relation to... Um, uh, roads and road building that uh, we support the, the decarbonisation of, of road use. So it's not necessarily the case that that leads to massive uh, increase uh, in emissions. We want to bring that down and that's why we're supporting uh, electric cars. We don't support, to answer directly Patrick Harvey's uh, question, for example, we do not have plans to introduce 
congestion charges or road user charging schemes, which was a recommendation. We don't have plans uh, to support that, although congestion charges would be a matter for local authorities. But we are doing everything within our power to take forward the climate change uh, agenda, and I'll play a very active role uh, within the Cabinet subcommittee on the matter. Briefly, Jimmy McGregor. Uh, what progress is being made in developing the use of hydrogen-powered vehicles? Where and by whom? Uh, well, I'm happy to write to the member with the details of where we've been able to support such projects, but we have been supporting projects through the grant uh, assistance that Scottish Government uh, provides. Thank you very much. Uh, question 8, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what opportunities enhanced devolution could bring to the transport system. Mr. Graham McKay. The Scottish Government signalled our commitment to enhance devolution of powers over transport in our submission to the Smith Commission. We argued that all transport policy, not currently the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament, should be devolved. Enhanced devolution is a natural step to take to ensure that our transport system is as consistent and integrated as possible, administratively and practically, to best meet the needs and aspirations of the people of Scotland. One example of the opportunities which enhanced devolution could bring to the transport system is a reduction in air passenger duty. We have confirmed that we intend to reduce APD by 50 per cent within the term of the next Parliament, with a view to eventual abolition of the tax when public finances allow. And of course, we have stated our view that connecting Scotland to High Speed 2 uh, is rail is a priority and that there should be a high speed connection between Glasgow, Edinburgh and North of England as part of any high speed rail network. Many thanks. Chick Brody. Uh, I got a supplementary. Mr Lyle, forgive me. <laughs> thank you, President <laughs> Officer. Can I thank the Minister for his response? Unlike most other countries, the Scottish Government does not currently have responsibility over borrowing powers. Can I ask the Minister, does he feel that the delivery of proper borrowing powers to this Parliament would allow us to invest in more infrastructure and in turn help to retain and create jobs which would boost our economy through the multiplier effect and, of course, make a long-term contribution to growth and productivity? Thank Minister. you, Presiding Officer. Yes, of course. Uh, we welcome the, 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 the extensions currently proposed, but we could go much further. And all the requests that members have made of the transport budget this afternoon, if we had enhanced financial flexibility uh, and the borrowing powers that this Parliament should have so that we can grow Scotland's economy. Brody, briefly, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the uh, Minister has answered a question that I had on air passenger duty, but can he tell me how discussions with the, uh, Her Majesty's Government in Westminster uh, is dealing with this issue and when will we hear more of the completion of these discussions? Well, it's now in the hands of the, the, the next, I'd imagine, the next Westminster government to take this forward. It was in the Smith Commission. It will be for the next government to fulfil the promises, the vow made to the people of Scotland, as the member would expect. We've had some technical discussions around the understanding uh, of uh, devolving uh, APD, and we hope that that power is secured for the Parliament and the Government so it can be used to the best effect for the economy of Scotland. Many thanks. Question 9, in the name of Adam Rangren, has not been lodged. An explanation has been provided. Question 10, John Mason. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the status of the Edinburgh-Glasgow Improvement Programme. Mr Derek Mackay. The Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme is making good progress and remains on schedule for the introduction for the first electric services from the Edinburgh to Glasgow via Falkirk High Route in December 2016. Passengers are already benefiting from the £25 million transformation of Haymarket Station and the Scottish Government's £80 million investment in the electrification of the line between Cumbernauld and Glasgow, both of which were completed on time and on budget. Thanks. John Mason. I understand that while the Winchborough Tunnel is closed, that uh, we will lose four trains per hour from Glasgow Queen Street High Level to Edinburgh, but ScotRail are only proposing to add one on, on an, uh, an additional route. Uh, can, the gov can the government comment as to whether that's going to be sufficient for the capacity? Sir? Well, Mr Mason is aware, because he was at the, the presentation and the briefing that I had arranged for all members of the Scottish Parliament, that there is a full communication exercise and uh, and, and arrangements uh, around this necessary period 
uh, of disruption that will keep to a minimum to allow that uh, excellent investment to happen. Passengers will still be able to make direct rail journeys between Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, on any of the other three routes connecting the cities, and ScotRail has provided assurance that their disruption management plan will make best use of available resources, including, where possible, additional capacity. Many thanks. And that concludes that series of questions. We now move to portfolio questions on culture, Europe and external affairs. Question one, Chick Brody. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what benefits it considers uh, Europe brings to Scotland. And Secretary Fiona has. Uh, EU membership has been a vibrant source of social, uh, cultural and economic benefit for Scotland over the last 40 years. Membership provides significant economic benefits, including access to the world's largest single market with over, over 500 million potential customers. In 2013, the EU was the destination for 46% of Scottish exports, worth some £12.9 billion. The Scottish Government also welcomes the social, cultural and economic benefits that migration from the EU delivers to Scotland's communities. Uh, the right to freedom of movement is also beneficial to Scots who move to live, work and study elsewhere in the EU. And I, this is why the Scottish Government will continue to make the case for Scotland's membership of the EU going forward as set out in Scotland's Action Plan for EU Engagement launched on the 27th of March 2015 and a booklet on the benefits of Scotland's EU membership was also published alongside this to further emphasise the advantages of Scotland enjoying uh, being part of the EU. Excellent. Chick Brody. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. The EET Committee recently held a session entitled Internationalising Scottish Business. In that session, former Labour Minister Brian Wilson, giving evidence, stated that 330,000 Scottish jobs depend on export in the UK, and he stated that it would be bonkers, bonkers to come out of Europe, and that every company and trade union has a vested interest to ensure we do not leave Europe. Can the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that Scotland's position is and always will be best served inside the European Union? Uh, yes, indeed I can. Uh, it is vital that Scotland remains within the EU to preserve the economic benefits of EU membership. And that is why, of course, the First Minister has proposed that if there was to be a referendum on the UK's EU membership, a vote to exit the EU should require not just a majority across the whole UK, but a majority in each of its four constituents' parts, a, a, a double majority, but of course not to have a referendum in the first place by locking out the Tories. Uh, that would be, of course, preferable. Many thanks. Uh, question two, John Pentland. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs will announce the location and timetable for the development of a permanent Scottish film studio. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. I advised the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee on the 4th of May that Scottish Enterprise had received a new proposal to provide studio infrastructure for Scotland. This proposal had to undergo due diligence and commercial negotiations to consider its viability. The due diligence uh, process is complete but has proved more complicated than first thought. Commercial negotiations are still ongoing and the proposal remains commercial in confidence at present. As such, I am unable to provide a definitive date at this time for any announcement on location or timetable for development of a permanent Scottish film studio, but will seek to make an announcement as soon as possible. Many thanks. John Pentland. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for reply, and I do hope you enjoyed your trip to Hollywood. Obviously, I would want to see the studio in North Lanarkshire, uh, even though the proposal for one near Edinburgh would be called Pentland Studios. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that we need to speed up progress on the proposal to use the industrial site in North Lanarkshire, where the project would be both welcome and give a much needed boost to the local economy. Well, I am aware of different uh, proposals um, uh, in relation to film studio location. Um, all I can say at the moment is our discussions are ongoing in relation to the proposal received by Scottish Enterprise. Uh, the member refers to um, the proposal of the, the, the studio located already in uh, his uh, regional constituency. I think it's worth reminding everyone that the Outlander production that is currently uh, being filmed uh, in Cumbernauld has actually had a £38 million budget for its first season. Uh, certainly, I was quite aware in my visit to uh, the United States the huge impact that is making and also uh, delighted that it's uh, filming in Scotland. Uh, and in terms of delivering an economic impact, uh, don't underestimate that this is the biggest 
uh, you know, inward investment in terms of uh, film uh, activity we've had in Scotland and is very much to be welcomed. But as you can appreciate, I can't give him uh, further information about location or details of that information. Many thanks. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, this is an issue I've pursued for many years now. And as recently as the 28th of April, the Cabinet Secretary was kind enough to reply to a parliamentary question from me in the same terms as she has done now to John Pentland. And I do understand the issues around due diligence and commercial confidentiality. But I would be very interested to know if, when the Cabinet Secretary makes the announcement, which sounds to me as though it may well be fairly imminent, whether she will do so by statement to Parliament, inspired PQ or press release. Secretary. Well, first of all, I've got to confirm that there would be uh, an announcement to be made, and I said uh, the due diligence has uh, been completed, but uh, there are further issues that have to be addressed. I'm very conscious of my responsibility to Parliament to make sure that I inform it in the appropriate way, uh, but I have not uh, yet determined what that would be. But obviously, I would respect Parliament. I'm very much aware of the need to communicate, whether it's by statement or indeed by question, or indeed, as I have previously, to committees in terms of evidence. We would very much hope so. Uh, David Stewart, briefly. Yeah, thank you, uh, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that my region, Highlands and Islands, has been the location of many famous films such as Braveheart, Harry Potter and Skyfall. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that the film studio in Samoa and Sky has first-class production facilities and is the ideal location for shooting film and TV? Um, I re recently attended the, the Celtic uh, Media Festival. Indeed, that was the point I made about the economic impact that Sam Rostig in the studio there and indeed um, Bannon, the, uh, the, the Gallic production, and the impact that that has made, uh, not just in Sky, but also uh, in the Western Isles. And I think it's really important in reflecting not just the scenery, but the economic impact. We're not just a location. It's actually about the attractiveness of the skills. And I think the development, particularly at Sam Rostig, is to be commended. It is about growing the infrastructure, yes, but it's also about skills development as well as taking the benefit of our wonderful locations. Many thanks. Uh, question three, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to the film and arts sectors in Shetland. Uh, Creative Scotland is the national leader for Scotland's arts, screen and creative industries. It distributes funding on behalf of the government. In 2013, Creative Scotland invested uh, over £745,000 in the Shetland Islands across 20 awards. An example of this was Shetland Arts Development Agency, a Creative Scotland annual client who received uh, £212,000 in 1314. Shetland's Arts Development Agency will become a regularly funded organisation from 2015-16 with £750,000 over three years. And of course, the largest investment in Shetland was to Shetland Arts Development Agency for the development of the Muriel, uh, the UK's most northerly music, cinema and creative industry centre, which was awarded over £2 million in 2008 9 Thanks, Rhoda Grant. I, I acknowledge that the Cabinet Secretary is aware of the Muriel Centre, which is a wonderful uh, broadcasting and film production unit in the islands. It's well used locally, but it has a lot of spare capacity. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what she's doing to try and attract the film industry to the Muriel Centre following the popular TV series Shetland? Uh, well, clearly, uh, the Muriel has had challenges, and I've been very supportive of the Muriel. I've visited uh, the Muriel on a number of occasions. Uh, in terms of opportunities for uh, further film activity with spare capacity, there's obviously a, uh, you know, if the member has uh, ideas and opportunities for uh, Muriel, I'd be more than happy to, to receive uh, any suggestions in writing, and I'll make sure Creative Scotland has that. Alternatively, she may want to uh, approach Creative Scotland directly. Mayor McGregor. Uh, thank you. How does the Scottish Government support traditional Scottish music, which is a big part of Shetland's vibrant art sector? Well, clearly the uh, wider uh, agencies um, that are there uh, are obviously supported by the variety of the arts development will support uh, different activity that's in uh, Shetland. Uh, clearly, in terms of traditional music, Fesh Ross has been fantastic development, particularly in the Highlands and Islands, and also in terms of um, celebration of different events and festivals, the Shetland Folk Festival uh, in particular and the Shetland Fiddle Frenzy. Um, there are a number of different events that take uh, place and are supportive by the development developments um, of the skills particularly, but also by funding and applications and anybody who applies, whether it's in traditional music or others, uh, other, other areas, have an opportunity to benefit from project funding, for example, from Creative Scotland. 
Many thanks. Uh, question four in Mark Griffin's name has not been lodged and an explanation has been provided. Question five, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what support it will give to local festivals and community celebrations across South Scotland, such as the Beltane in Peebles, Lanamers in Lanark, and the Wickerman Festival in Dumfries and Galloway. Cabinet Secretary. All of Scotland's festivals, both big and small, national and outlook like the Wickerman Festival or community focused like the Peebles, Beltane and the Lanamers in Lanark, are a hugely important aspect of our culture. Scottish Government supports our festivals through Creative Scotland and visits Scotland's Events Directorate, Events Scotland. Creative Scotland supports festivals that apply directly to it for funding, while Events Scotland supports a portfolio of events through its national, international and beacon programmes designed to assist events grow their audience. Support is also available through Themed Year funding, which in 2015 is linking inspirational events with the Year of Food and Drink. Thanks so much. Claudia Beamish. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, um, that answer. It is a testament indeed, um, as I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will agree, to local communities and, the, and imaginative individuals that year after year they commit vo both voluntary time and money to support these festivals and celebrations. Um, what support can be given specifically by Visit Scotland uh, to help promote and market these events to ensure that rural and small town fes uh, festivities don't lose out to the cities? and that they are used to maximise home and foreign tourism opportunities, as there has been some disappointment in this regard so far. Thank you. Uh, well, clearly the responsibility for a visit Scotland lies with Fergus Ewing as the Tourism Minister, uh, but as we've debated fairly recently in, in this chamber, the role of... Uh, uh, festivals and indeed rural festivals are very important to the economy of Scotland and certainly in my discussions with Visit Scotland, uh, part of what we want to try and promote is an awareness that you don't just come to the cities to, for cultural experiences, that actually in terms of, uh, you know, if you look across Scotland across the calendar year uh, you will find a festival of some description and we need to improve how we promote um, Scotland as a, a, a you know, as a, a festival nation of a, a, a description. Uh, in terms of marketing of that, however, that is a matter for Visit Scotland and I'll ask them to uh, communicate with the member what plans they have. Excellent. Question six, Ken McIntosh. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Creative Scotland. Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government regularly meets Creative Scotland to discuss its plans, progress and priorities. Uh, most recently I attended the British Film Commission familiarisation visit reception with Creative Sc uh, Scotland staff on the 25th of April. Uh, this event welcomed TV studio executives from Los Angeles to Scotland. I also met the new chair of Creative Scotland, Richard Finlay, on the 1st of April to discuss his new role. And McIntosh. Can I thank the, the uh, Minister for her answer? In their evidence to the Education and Culture Committee uh, in their inquiry on the attainment gap in Scottish schools, uh, the trade union Unison was just one of many organisations which highlighted the importance of the arts. And I think they gave us their example, uh, the benefit for, on your English marks, for example, of going to see a play as opposed to reading it out loud in the class. They then went on to highlight that... Point is. Sorry, Your question is... Yes, they went on to highlight the importance of uh, out-of-school charges... Uh, and the importance, therefore, of being supported in school, but that charges were making this less likely. In other words, we're likely to increase the attainment gap. Can I ask the Minister how much, either in percentage or real terms, is Creative Sp Scotland spending on poorer and deprived uh, households and helping them access the arts? Uh, in terms of the exact amount, I wouldn't necessarily be able to give you that in detail now, but I'm happy to, to follow that up. Uh, part of my discussion with the new chair was the government's priorities, the three government's priorities um, as set out in our programme for government, of which tackling inequalities is one of them. And there are different ways of doing that in relation to the attainment gap. I would refer the member, though, to, I think, one of the most seminal pieces of research that we've shown, that although uh, viewing uh, and, and seeing uh, plays, productions, uh, is important. What has a bigger impact on young people is participation. And participation, regardless of parental income, um, will have a, a bigger influence on whether people subsequently enjoy arts and, uh, as, as an adult. And I think in terms of you know, closing attainment gaps or, or closing an inequality gap of any description, it's really important that we focus on participation. That isn't to say that viewing and being able to see productions is really important. And one of the things I've actually asked our national companies is they already do a great deal of work in terms of taking performances around the country, uh, both our, our orchestras and indeed our theatre and ballet. And I think that's something that I think 
that Parliament should perhaps become more familiar with. And so I'll ask them to make sure and communicate with members the activity they have in their own constituencies, uh, reaching out to make sure that those young people who might never be taken to see a play or performance by their parents do have the opportunity uh, to see such. Many thanks. Claire Baker. And thank you, President Officer. Um, at the weekend, I was at a paying artists campaign event which was highlighting issues of artists not being paid. I'm pleased that since October, Creative Scotland has put it in their guidelines that they expect, um, if there's a funding application, that artists will be paid the standard rates. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary say what more can be done to encourage and enforce these standards and rates of play, uh, pay wider throughout the arts and cultural sector? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think it's very important that Creative Scotland has made that a part of um, the requirements. I, it, again, it's an issue I've raised some time ago, actually, I think before Claire Baker was in this position, I raised it proactively with Creative Scotland and the importance of paying artists. I think there's two things. It's one is in terms of uh, the public expectation and the second is in terms of funding requirements for funding bodies. I think there's something about raising the awareness, awareness of the, the issue uh, more generally. I think uh, far too often people think about charitable uh, events or different events where you can ask people to come along and not expect them to, to be paid. And I think actually generally across all of society there's more to be done in recognising the importance of actually paying for uh, that performance that you've uh, received. So I think the, uh, that, that probably is the area that needs more focus and emphasis to seeing what's acceptable or not. And that's implicit on everybody asking at different events are artists being paid. Many thanks. Neil Finlay. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in bringing to an end the dispute at the National Museum of Scotland. Government Secretary. Uh, as I said in my response to Drew Smith, MSP, last week, I have met with both the Chair and Director of the Museums and representatives of the unions and strongly encouraged both sides to develop a more productive working relationship to try and negotiate an agreement which would resolve this dispute. The two sides met most recently on the 13th of April and have agreed to maintain contact. Finlay. Um, given that the uh, Justice Secretary managed to get £7 million out of the Finance Secretary to prevent a strike in the prison service in our up to this and next year's election, does the Cabinet Secretary for Culture have so little clout in the Cabinet that she cannot even weasel £200,000 from John Swinney to pay low pay staff in the National Museums the money they are owed for working unsociable hours? And can I ask her, will she spare us in her answer any reference to Wales, England, Ulan Bator or indeed anywhere else that she has no responsibility for and instead concentrates her answer on what she does have responsibility Cabinet for. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I say to the member, of course, the reason he doesn't want me to mention Wales is because they're wanting to take away weekend working allowances from those who already have it, and that's not the situation here in Scotland. I, I would hope that um, clearly the, the member would do a bit of research before he comes. He knows he was in the chamber when I made it clear last week that the cost of uh, the proposal would be £400,000 a year. That's a, an estimation of the next... Uh, the, the next uh, spending review of 1.2 million. He's also wrong in another area. There is no, no strike agreement with the POA in Scotland. Of course, the only person that did in, introduce that was Jack Straw, a Labour, a Labour Home Secretary. And he's also wrong on another count. On, on another count. Point of order, Mr Finlay. I, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary will ref reflect on her comments and correct the record. I never said there was a no-strike agreement. Maybe she'll correct the record when she gets the opportunity. Mr Finlay, you very well know that's not a point of order, but you've made your point. Cabinet Secretary, please and conclude. And Neil Finlay's uh, wrong on, on a third element, because the SPS found funding within their existing budget um, because the agreement was made in good faith to incentivise engagement of prison officers' staff in a process of discussion. The issue we have to have in relation to the NMS is to try and get both parties to actually have a discussion that is not just predicated on reintroduction or introduction of a new uh, weekend working allowance to staff on new contracts since 2011. Many thanks. Question 8, Mary Scanlon. Ask the Scottish Government how it monitors proceedings at the European Parliament. Uh, the Scottish Government monitors proceedings in the European Parliament through the Scottish Government's EU office based in Brussels. Mary Scanlon. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary and indeed the Scottish Government Cabinet will be fully aware of the Medium Combustion Plants Directive, which has the potential to cost thousands of jobs and slow down North Sea oil production by up to 60%. So why did Scottish Nationalist MEPs in the last hour choose not to vote for Ian Duncan's amendment to exempt North Sea oil rigs? 
Well, the matters for European Parliament are the matters for European Parliament. I, the member might not have noticed, but I've actually been in this chamber, I think, since uh, the beginning of the session at two o'clock when I led a debate on uh, the Mediterranean, well, uh, on the Mediterranean deaths um, of migrants. In terms of the uh, references she made to the medium combustion plants directive, the Scottish Government is fully aware um, of the issue. Um, obviously, in terms of what that means for Scotland, in cooperation with the UK permanent representation um, in the EU office. We have been working with the policy team um, in this issue. We've uh, offered further briefing to all Scottish MEPs on the importance of this issue and also directed them to Scottish and Southern's EU liaison officer in relation to some of those issues. So we are aware of them. They have been discussed, not just here, but also in the European Parliament. But I'm not accountable for events in, in Brussels within the last hour. Uh, Stuart, Stevens. Stuart Maxwell, finally. Officer, uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Scottish Commemorations Programme's First World War Commemorations for 2015. Uh, the programme events to commemorate World War I dates of particular relevance to the people of Scotland is progressing well for both 2015 and beyond to 2019. On Saturday 25th of April, the First Minister and I were privileged to take part in the dawn service for the Gallipoli and Anzac Day commemorations at Edinburgh Castle. The next national event is the commemoration of the Quintus Hill Rail disaster, which will take place with services in both Gretna and Rosebank Cemetery Leith on Friday the 22nd and Saturday the 23rd of this month. And in Stirling on the 4th of June, I'll attend an evening reception followed by uh, Hugh Strawn's lecture, 1915, The Search for Solutions, commemorating the troops leaving Scotland for Gallipoli from Stirling Castle. Uh, this will mark the opening of a weekend of commemorative activity in Stirling uh, with a photographic exhibition, a play by local children and displays by military bands from both Scotland and Turkey. Sure, Mike. Cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and offer my own personal congratulations to the Scottish Commemorations Panel on its successful programme of events uh, last year. However, will the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on the progress of the Centenary Memorials Restoration Fund and confirm which war memorial projects in the west of Scotland region have benefited, benefited from this fund? Briefly, uh, I'm not aware of the detail from the west of Scotland in particular, and indeed the Commemorative uh, Memorial Restoration Fund is actually being run by Historic Scotland, and I'll ask them to provide particular details uh, to the member. Um, in terms of the, uh, and also I might add, uh, Heritage Lottery Fund are responsible for some of these, so I'll identify which ones are from uh, Heritage Lottery as well. I think the member's right to uh, pay tribute to the work of the Scottish Commemorations Panel, and um, they've set a, a range of different events. Uh, in a very considered and thoughtful way and I'd like to thank in particular Chair Norman Drummond and all the members of the board for guiding us through um, the next few years. Many thanks and that concludes portfolio questions and it's now time to move on to the next item of business which is decision time and to which we now come and there are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 13090 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The, the second question is that motion 13091 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee membership be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And that concludes decision time and I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>